I thank uh, Fernando Albiac and Gilles Gautefroy and Peter Casasa who are not here for this kind of invitation. And let me try to explain you the story of uh, this paper. It will be published now, but the version you have on the blackboard is from 2004. And the topic probably started earlier, by 96 or so. The problem, what I wanted to do in the beginning, by 96, is this. Um, we all knew that you can take a Hilbert space and twist it something I write in this form and get the Carlton Peck set to space. Right? This is a Banach space, which contains a copy of L2, and the quotient is again L2, but the space is not a Hilbert space. It's not by far. And the question, the origin was, can I twist this space again? Can I get a Banach space which contains a 2 as a subspace? The quotient is again Z2, but the space is not isomorphic to the product of Z2 and Z2. Can I do this? The methods we have, well, in my story, I will mix the things we know today and the things I, I knew then. But past and present more or less are the same. So the methods to, to twist uh, um, spaces, essentially, we have three. The one is the Carlton Peck quasi-linear method. The middle one. Good. The method is that if you have an exact sequence of quasi Banach spaces, Banach spaces for us, this is the same that a certain type of map called quasi linear maps from the quotient into the subspace. The way in which you get this map, just to have some idea is get here a bounded selection, homogeneous bounded selection for the quotient map, something you can do by the open mapping theorem, get a linear selection for the quotient map, something you can do by the vector space structure, and make the difference. The resulting map is not bounded, it's not linear, it's not continuous, it's not anything, but is good enough to describe the exact sequence. In categorical terms, the outstanding feature of this transformation is that this describes a natural transformation of exact sequence into functions, and you can do with functions many things that you have problems to do with exact sequence. For example, sum. You can sum to functions, and well, people in algebra know how to sum to twisted sums, but you have to work a while to do that. So, the Carlton Peck methods establish that exact sequence is the same as quasi maps. So, what you have to do is to define a good quasi map. The problem is that in this paper, the, the quasi map can be constructed when we are working on a base, a spaces with unconditional bases. This is the Carlton Peck uh, twisted sum of sequence spaces. The sequence spaces means 
spaces with unconditional bases. And the set two space has no unconditional bases. Actually, Carlton has a beautiful paper that nobody could improve, saying that any twisted sum of two Hilbert spaces, if admits an unconditional basis, is a Hilbert space, actually. We cannot do e that even for LP. Well, so the method was not good enough by then to twist set two. Then the second method we can rely on is, say, local theory. Local theory, local theory is, um, okay, imagine, you can imagine that the things are like this. You have Banach space theory, and you have here exact sequences theory. And theorems that you have on Banach spaces, you can translate to exact sequences. You have a Han Banach theorem here, you have here Han Banach theorem. You have a um, local theory here, you have a local theory here. Of course, the problem is to discover which is the exact statement and the properties and then to prove it. Local theory is something like, well, if I had to twist L2, the Hilbert space, something I can try is to twist, say, L2n with L2n, and get something here, xn. And if I can do this in a way that each time, depending on n, this sequence is increasingly far from Hilbert, which means that projections here have norm going to infinity on n. If I can do this, then I passed all these things with L2. and you get a twisted sum of Hilbert spaces, we cannot be a Hilbert space. Essentially, this is what did Enflow in the Straum PCA in the first paper in which they constructed the first twisted sum of uh, Hilbert space non-Hilbert. The idea is do the same in other cases. But we cannot do this as it is with set two, because set two is not the past in the sense of L2 or in the sense of anything of pieces. You have to do something different. This different is the local theory, right? Banach spaces containing L2 ends uniformly then can be twisted for some local reasons. Uh, if sequences locally behave well and the space is complemented in the way dual, then the space can be twisted, all that type of things. Using this local theory, I can construct a twisted sum of set two show that it exists, but the problem is that I know nothing about the sequence. I know that it exists some twist, and I want to know something, right? Um, the something usually comes from the knowledge of the Quaiselina map, because with this Quaiselina map, you can tell who is this x. This x as a vector space is the product, and the norm on it is this. That you can imagine is a twist of the direct product. When omega is zero is the direct product, when omega is something different is a twist. Right. But at least I have a formula of the norm, I can do something, I can study properties of the space, I can do something. But the local theory only tells you that there is one, who knows what. Um, and the third way to twist spaces is using diagrams. You rely on homological algebra, and you rely on the properties of spaces, arrows, points, to get things. Essentially, let me give you an example. Um, when you have an exact sequence and you have one operator here going for another space, then you can make a complete picture in this way. 
and has a name, the push out. Imagine for a moment, this is like learning, say, Chinese. Okay? We are going to learn Chinese. So, this is the ideogram, and you learn push out. And say push out. Whenever you see it, you say push out. And the same in the dual diagram. Whenever you have an exact sequence and one operator, you can complete the diagram and get this. It's called the pullback. In Chinese, pullback. And one get, has to be um, accustomed to recognize these diagrams in the situations, know that they describe some objects, some banana spaces. I mean, there are theorems saying whatever you picture is true. I mean, it's a banana space theorem saying something of somebody. And then try use them to construct the twisted sum you want. In the case of set two, let me see if I learned the process. Good. And good. Almost good. Ek. Yeah. Don't panic. Um, <laughs> I will explain now uh, what is there. The point is that playing with these diagrams, you can construct this type of cubes, and you cannot see it yet, but there is a diagonal sequence in the... Look at the bottom of the cube. This is so sensible. this there is this is the bottom of the other diagram I don't know why it's twisted but <laughs> you can see in the bottom something like an exact sequence beginning with set 2 and set 2 and something in the middle right or we can do it even better oh god this another cube and in the middle in the bottom middle you can see a sequence beginning with set 2 set 2 and somebody in the middle. So, diagrams also allow you to construct a twisted sum of set two. The point is, which one, which properties has. <laughs> the good thing about the diagrams is that, um, say, you can even know the properties of the space. With this, we are in 2004. This is the conference, uh, recent trends in Banach Spaces in Jerusalem in honor to Linda Strauss and Tafiri. Recent trends, I think recent trends in Banach Spaces. So by then, well, sometime earlier I had discussed uh, with Nigel this type of ideas. I was sure that he knew how to twist uh, set two. In, I don't know if using Quaisenia maps or, or local theory or something, but I'm sure that he knew. And I showed him these diagrams. I still remember the face, it was, we were with uh, Wolf and Lusky, and he took the paper, this one, and say, oh, you have to add oh, to this the ironic way of Nigel to say things, uh, how nice to be in a paper with such beautiful diagrams. I still remember that. So, um, the point is that somehow he wanted to, be t to get involved, but, but I had to find a way to motivate him to do something. Because diagram as well, he liked diagrams, but not his taste. And the point is that there is a problem behind. I wanted to know by then. We are in now in 2002, 2004. The problem was how to translate this problem into uh, something tasteful for Nigel. And the key comes because there is a fourth way to twist uh, spaces. It is complex theory, complex interpolation. In complex interpolation, you have 
a Banach space of vector uh, valued functions, holomorphic uh, vector valued functions. Um, you have here a scale of spaces you want to interpolate. And turns out that taking values, the valuation map at some point, gives you here a space which is the, interpolate, uh, the interpolated space. But whenever you have a map, you make the complete diagram. Right? I, I don't need to write the zeros, I'm right? Then you have the evaluation of the derivative. The evaluation of the derivative in H take values who knows where, but on the kernel, the evaluation of the derivative take values in the same space. And if we learn already some Chinese, we are ready to see this and recognize a push out. So whenever you see this, which is this diagram, you say, uh huh. So we have here something like this. And the sequence here on the back at the bottom is a twisted sum of the interpolated space, which essentially means that any Banach space that you obtain via interpolation, you can twist in a rather natural way, which is this. In particular, if we can apply this to set two or not, wait a minute. In the particular case, you start here with L1, L infinity. Imagine this is L2, right? Take the value at theta one half. Then go to the kernel. This is again L2. And the space here, you can compute, which is exactly nothing different from set two the Calton Peck uh, space. And this is the way in which the Calton Peck space appears also by complex interpolation. Right? Of course, Nigel knew all this much better than knowing. He knew and he made a beautiful theorem saying that whenever you have a scale, interpolation scale, then the evaluation here produces a quasi-linear map, something like the derivative there, which is the quasi-linear map associated to this sequence, right? which is this diagram. But, and this is the theorem, if you give me this quasi-linear map, which is a quasi-linear map with some extra properties that he called centralizers, whenever you give me a centralizer, he can reproduce which was exactly the scale from which you got this centralizer and even which were the endpoints of the scale. Right? For instance, L2, you can get it from interpolation between almost anything, almost anything, a Banach space and the dual. Well, each of these scales produces a centralizer. And knowing the centralizer, you can recover which was the scale. At least, in the ambient space of Cote function spaces. But Cote function spaces is something much bigger than spaces with unconditional bases. So this schema is enough to twist in a quite natural way set two. Um, well, just to conclude with this part, imagine here that L2, you can twist it from L1, L infinity, but you can also choose two different endpoints Knowing the centralizer, you can know which were the which was the scale and the endpoints, both things, right? So, which is the problem which I wanted to involve uh, Nigel? How did he get involved, and, and and so on? Think on this. Think on this. Um, Coming back to this first hand, second hand, first level, second level things, Banach space theory, exact sequences. Uh, let's put one example, one theorem in 
the first level. In the, the idea is that in the Banach space level, the things that live are operators between Banach spaces. In the next level, what lives are quite cellular maps or centralizers. So, one example of one theorem in the first level. There is a very nice theorem of Johnson and Thiepin showing that whenever you have a subspace of C0 and you have here one operator into C01, then you can extend it to C0. So, the same theorem in the next level says something like when you have a quasi linear map here you can extend it or not <laughs> here i never been able to prove this this is open if i can do or not said in a slightly different way if you draw the sequence up to the end this sequence has associated a quasi-cellular map here, lambda. And this quasi-cellular map here exactly means an exact sequence, beginning with C01, going somewhere, ending in H. Right? This is the omega seen as exact sequence, this is the embedding of H into C0, seen as an exact sequence, of the both things. And if we can do this, if this map can be extended here, then let me paint here the sequence, right, this is that. If you say that there is a quasi linear map here extending, this means that here there is something. The general properties of the Chinese, I mean of the diagrams, says that we can complete this thing. And altogether, you can see in this way. The point is, if whenever you have an exact sequence and another exact sequence here, we can split in this way. Exact sequence, exact sequence, right? And we can split. If we can make this diagram out of two sequences, one after the other. This was the question for me. Something that in homological algebra you can say if omega lambda is zero. For people who know, this has to do with the second derived function x2 and all that type of things. But in diagrammatic terms is if we can twist these things in function space means that if we can extend these nonlinear maps and the point if was if i could make some interest of this to nigel so that he get involved because if you look at the diagram when we twist set to look for a moment at the previous diagram, not this, this one. And look at the bottom, again at the bottom of the diagram, which I depicted here. Well, sorry, small. <laughs> this is the bottom of the other diagram. And in the bottom, you can see here in horizontal, the quasi map of Carlton Peck, the Carlton Peck map, and in vertical, the Carlton Peck map, and both are split, which means in this language that if this is the Carlton Peck map, and here you put again the Carlton Peck map, somehow this map you can extend here. There is an extension. The extension is the vertical middle arrow you see there. This question, I could put in the language interesting to Nigel. He says that if you take the Carlton Beck map, the square is zero. During this time, uh, Felix Cabello appeared. He very came with his own theory of making things using uh, by 
quasi linear maps, something very interesting because again playing with this same idea, what he did is what he did is for exactly the same reason that operators from X into Y star are the same as operators from Y into X star. And all this is the same as by linear maps X, Y into R, right? The same with quasi linear maps. So, quasi linear maps from X into Y star is the same as quasi linear maps here is the same as some strange object ca called quasi by B quasi linear maps. And with this, he can treat at the same time the twisting of the spaces and the dual, and the twisting of the duals. The point is that using this uh, point of view, he can produce again the same, that whatever centralizer you give me, the square is zero. The reason this uh, theory or interpolation theory. And the question we could not solve, we wanted, Nigel get involved with, is what happens if you give me two different centralizers? Has to be zero or not? To see this, again, let's go to the beginning. Here. And, yeah. I don't know if you can read, but in the end, these were the notes by then, it's written blah, 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 uh, two quasi linear maps, the product is zero, blah, blah, blah. Nigel, this is up to you. The point is, <laughs> if the composition of two could be zero. Because, talking with them, the idea is, when I have one centralizer, I have an interpolation method. And this interpolation produces the twisting. When I have another, I have another interpolation method, and this produces the twisting. With two different, what I have to do is to produce an interpolation method that gives me both, somehow past both. And this I discussed it many times with him. He was quite convinced that I could do. Uh, Felix did a lot of things on this. Then came the 2010, was the meeting in Valencia, uh, meeting in Valencia, uh, some homage to Valdivia. I organized there a, a session, Nigel came, gave a beautiful lecture on uniform selections, and then we talked on this, and he said, no, I can't do anything else. I'm not able to, to pass this to centralize it into something. So I said, well, we close the paper then with the case omega square, and that's it, that's it. The next new was uh, last day of the summer of 2010, and Nigel passed away. So we left the paper, the, the theory, everything in, in time. One, maybe two years later, we received a message from Gretzky, who manages the, the page, Nigel uh, Memorial page, saying, we found a manuscript in the drawer of Nigel saying uh, a lot of things. Is this a paper? This is something. So we said, well, why not think again on this and try if we can make. And this second time, well, well, I use this one. This second time, things have changed because In the middle, we learned something we knew from the beginning, but knowing something and learning something different. There is a paper of Rochberg, Richard Rochberg, in which he explains a lot of things connecting somehow twisted sums with interpolation. The essential result we all knew from the beginning is that when you see this sequence, 
the space in the middle, when you look at V interpolation, via complex interpolation, is the space of pairs function derivative. The norm on this set of pairs you have to put is the infimum of the norms of the functions taking these values. This gives you an alternative description of the twisted sum space. The point is that in that paper, Rochberg does the same with other constructions. Right? Why to stop in the derivative? Why not Why not make it this? And the point is that this, more or less, gives you a description of the next twisted sum spaces. Here the trick is that you don't have to use the derivative, but the Taylor coefficients. So instead of here, one. This I have on the blackboard is exactly a description of the natural twisted sum of set two that appears via complex interpolation. Said in another way, or better, said right from the start. If you have an interpolation schema, complex interpolation, Calderon space of functions, uh, scale of interpolation, and then you construct this space. Set N, this is from the function up to N minus 1 derivative. This Taylor coefficients, right? So 1, N minus 1 factorial, and so on. The norm of this space is the infimum of the norms of the functions f taking these values. So the space is finite sequences of values. The point is that these spaces you can arrange in whatever in whatever way you want as a twisted sum. The embedding is that if you have here n values of angulomorphic functions, here you put as n values and then zero. The only thing to check is that there is an holomorphic function whose first k derivatives are zero and then the values you already fix it. The projection, you have n plus k values, project on the first k. And this arrange, <laughs> this makes all things in exact sequences and in the squares, because here you can put xm, xn, xm minus m, and so on. So it's the perfect twist of all things we wanted. Gives you a nice description of the twisted sum of the spaces, a nice description of set two. You can even check and calculate the associated quasi linear maps, and you can prove some properties of the spaces. For instance, uh, this space here in the middle is not a twisted sum of Hilbert space and cannot be embedded into a twisted sum of Hilbert space. Things like this. This is the paper that Will, Will actually wrote and published. Somehow is closer of Nigel ideas from the beginning. And the only thing I regret is that does not contain those beautiful diagrams uh, he loved so much. It's the only thing. Um, well, let me close with two or three ideas of what now? Well, half-baked ideas. Carlton Calculus is the name that uh, Gilles uh, invented for this beautiful theory of Nigel of associating uh, scales of uh, interpolation scales with centralizers, right? 
properties, how properties jump from one place to the other. The point is that the Calton peak sequence, the starting one, L2, Z2, L2, the cone sheet map is strictly singular. A property, mm, a very good property. This property passes through all these things done in, uh, with the scales, with the continuous scales. If the first sequence you get is strictly singular, if it is, something you have to check on your hands, then all the others are. So we started to think if there is something like we could call Calton's strictly singular calculus. Right? If you can, Valentin will come now, I will explain you everything, or at least a few things on that. The strict singularity of the quotient map is interesting because when you want to twist HI spaces, the fact that the twisted sum is an HI space exactly depends on the quotient map is strictly singular. Um, just to give an idea, you have the scale, here you have the centralizer associated, how the scale reflects the proper, the strict singularity of the, of the map. The wild idea is that somehow proof that if the spaces in the scale are incomparable, this means the strict singularity of the centralizer. The closer we are is an extremely nice result of Valentin saying the contrary, that under some conditions, if this map is singular, then the space on the scale are incomparable. Maybe related to this, I'm not sure, should be the Calton's trivial calculus. <laughs> I mean, usually the definition of trivial map in quasi-linear terms is bounded plus linear. Nevertheless, you go to the Calton's paper, the differential complexes, and the definition he uses from triviality is bounded. This is bounded triviality. Why? Why? Because the theorems work with bounded triviality. And why? Because there is no a theory working in the trivial case. These linear maps all around, if you let them inside, is a mess. So there is not a theory of, of the correspondence taking into account this lin these trivial maps. Again, the closer we are is that in the context of quarter spaces, you can prove that this map is trivial in the general sense, if and only if the, the well, if, but if it's trivial, the quarter spaces are one, the other up to a weight. There was a theorem, a, a remark of Carlton and Casas in a paper saying that this happens in sequence spaces, something we had done in some uh, other paper, but the point is that they work also for quarter spaces. I mean, you have quarter spaces and this map is trivial, what you expected to get is that, well, the only way to get a trivial map is that the two spaces are the same. But no, can be not the same, can be the same up to a weight. So how to manage these linear maps is still a mess. The other methods, well, everything we do here, I mentioned um, Rochberg complex interpolation, but you can do it more or less with other methods. There is a paper of um, Maria Jesus Carro, Joan Cerda and Fernando Soria, in which they somehow explain how the real G method, the real K method, can be fit in the same schema. So one could do the same. Could do the same is one thing, how to do it is something different. For instance, this is my favorite topic, although I have nothing interesting to say, but the control function. The control function means that when you have a twisted sum, everything depends on the quasi linear map, so everything depends on this. And this is what they call the control function. Actually, the definition says the map is quasi linear in the Banach space term if this is smaller than some constant. Right. But this bound is too large to say anything sensible. The point is how we can control this function. And the problem inside is not uh, how to control this function. The problem is how to make this a function. 
because this is not a function. This is something taking values in blocks of elements of the space. In the work with uh, Valentin and with Manuel González, some magic formula appears. The formula is that when you start with an interpolation scale, then somehow this be uh, behaves like the logarithm of which is a function. This is some kind of asymptotic estimate in the space. And this you get is not so strange. After the moment, we think that the, the Carlton Peck maps essentially are this. Where A0 and A1 is, sorry, A0 and A1 is the uh, Lozanowski factorization in the depolation scale. I mean, the part on the right is you have a scale, you have a point, you have the centralizer here. Well, this centralizer essentially is this x logarithm of the Lozanowski factorization of x. With this idea, you get an asymptotic estimate on the space of a certain type, and this behaves as the control function, actually with x here. But we cannot reproduce for the moment this for other methods. So something is not clear here. Well, this is most of what I wanted to say. Um, from time to time, I think, this is only my personal view, that actually Nigel's last paper is something in the drawer that says, paraphrasing Leona Cohen, I have tried in my way to be me. Thank you very much for coming and This one? Final version of the paper. Sorry? The final version of the paper you want, well, or this one? Ah, the diagram is the old one. Is this? One. <laughs> yes, I have it. <laughs> I have it. <laughs> you don't need microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Well, there is a question about the Carlton Peck space, which is very famous, of course, and it is to know whether the space is isomorphic to its hyperplanes. Valentin will explain you everything you want to know now. Okay, so you have the answer already, <laughs> Valentin? Or? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to be a spoiler. <laughs> but uh, one related question could be now that you have twisted, twisted Hilbert spaces. Mm -hmm. If you twist Z2 with itself, you would expect maybe a space 
that would be isomorphic to its subspaces of co-dimension four mm -hmm. and not to the others. Am I just daydreaming or is there any hope in this direction? We didn't do that. We, we haven't checked that. Actually, the only thing we, we check is that this uh, twisted sum does not contain a true complemented, something expected, uh, the map is singular, blah, blah, blah. And then we constructed another twisted sum of C2 containing L2 complemented, just to see that not all things are natural. But uh, I, I don't know that. You, you, we didn't check that. Because uh, the big hope would be that, I mean, uh, we all know that Gowers had construction of mm -hmm. those strange spaces uh, mm -hmm. which are isomorphic to some subspace and mm -hmm. of finite co-dimension and not the others in between, that this link of twisted, twisted, twisted object mm -hmm. could provide more or less natural uh -huh. examples of this kind. But this might be uh, maybe a very optimistic conjecture. So.